It's already been a year. Starship first flight anniversary. So much change. Flight 4 preparations continue. What happened to the tiles? Rocket Lab is getting close to electron reuse. Mars sample return is in danger. And ExoMars restarted. My name is Felix. Welcome to What About It. Let's dive right in. Starship updates. The grind never stops. SpaceX is zooming through the pre-flight checklist, ticking off one thing after another. In fact, they are going so fast that we may see some massive infrastructure changes even before Flight 4. Wanna learn more? Follow me. You know what they say, time flies when you're having fun. And nowhere is that statement more true than at Starbase. Can you believe it's been nearly a year since the first flight of Starship? Well, almost. This video premieres on April 19th, just a day shy of the first anniversary of the first Starship flight ever. That is reason enough for us to take a look at what's happened since. It's incredible to think just how much the Gateway to Mars and the Starship have evolved since that liftoff. Booster 7 and Ship 24 were the pioneers, the ones that revealed the unknown challenges simply because the engineers couldn't encounter them until the rocket actually took off. Barely good enough for a launch, it was an intense journey right from the start. It all began with three engines that were shut down from the get-go and an onboard fire that started almost immediately after liftoff. Tiles were stripped off and parts were torn from the vehicle, but Starship continued its ascent, providing crucial data to the engineers. Then, just when most people were anticipating a separation, Starship began to tumble, which triggered the flight termination system. Unfortunately, even that didn't work properly, leaving the rocket spinning with massive holes in its propellant tanks. Finally, about four minutes into the flight, Starship experienced what we call a rapid unscheduled disassembly, or RUD for short. Despite the dramatic ending, the flight was deemed a success overall based on the new data gathered about the rocket. However, the same couldn't be said about the launch site. It was a disaster. Despite hopes that the concrete below the launch pad could survive the liftoff, the ground beneath it didn't. This caused the surface to bend and crack, sending concrete chunks in all directions. The launch table was busted as it took that first Starship ages even to get away from the launch mount. It roasted everything for way too long. The tank farm looked like a battlefield marked with dents from shockwaves and debris. It did not take long for the headlines to pop up everywhere. Musk's Mars rocket a total failure. The launch complex appeared to be a lost cause as well. Surely they wouldn't be able to fix any of that, right? Wrong. This is where an incredible journey began. The workers repaired or replaced every damaged part, restoring it to full functionality in less than seven months. A critical takeaway from the launch was the undeniable need for some form of active cooling on the launch pad. This led to the installation of the now famous flame deflector, which has since protected the launch site during every subsequent engine test or launch. And it works unbelievably well. The lessons learned from the first flight were also crucial in upgrading subsequent Starship prototypes, culminating in the next two flights being significantly more successful than the first one. That was definitely a wild year. And the best part is that looking back another year from now, we'll likely discuss achievements like reaching orbit and potentially even successfully catching the booster. Even though many said that SpaceX was on the wrong track, look at it now, only 12 months later. What do you think Starship will achieve by this time next year? Drop your predictions in the comments and let's revisit them in 2025. But the improvement didn't stop with just that first flight and there's still a long journey ahead. The launch site is a hive of activity, as shown in this time-lapse captured by our photographer John. Currently, much of the focus is on the booster quick disconnect panel and its new door. There's also ongoing work on the launch mount's legs, where welders are busy repairing cracks that appeared during the last launch. These repairs are routine and have been done after previous flights as well, so there is nothing to worry about. While the launch table prepares to host Booster 11, intriguing developments are also occurring at the tank farm located along Highway 4. In the last episode, I told you that the new horizontal tanks are in the process of being brought online. We also discussed whether SpaceX can continue using both horizontal and vertical tanks since they've been reinforced enough to a point where a launch is no longer a danger to them. And it looks like we've just got our answer. It is very unlikely that those vertical tanks are here to stay. 
On the night of April 17th, our photographers ventured out to capture some stunning nighttime shots at the site. It was during this visit that they noticed something intriguing about the vertical liquid nitrogen tank at the front of the farm. It has a marking on one of its rings. Scattered gravel around the area also hinted that preparations were being made for crane access. You know what this means, right? This tank is about to be retired or rather scrapped. Acetylene torch party coming up. <laughs> what? Considering that lately we've been seeing more and more venting from the horizontal bullet tanks, SpaceX may have started filling them with fluids necessary for Starbase operations. We suspect that the first few of the new tanks are being used to store liquid nitrogen. Thanks to Redline Helicopter Tours, the layout from the air suggests that the first four tanks are dedicated to nitrogen, while the remaining are likely for liquid oxygen. Another piece of evidence to support that theory could be the fact that the vaporizers in front of these far-right tanks are labeled for liquid oxygen. However, at this stage, this is pure speculation. While one team is busy ensuring that the launch site is fully operational, another is focused on preparing the vehicles for the upcoming fourth flight. Let's start with the booster. The installation of the new door and the construction of the Star Factory have limited our ability to capture images of the Super Heavy prototypes. One thing we do know for sure, it has yet to receive its hot staging ring. We can say much more about Ship 29 though. Looking at the prototype, it is clear that SpaceX's engineers are committed to making sure this one makes it through re-entry. The number of heat tiles being removed and replaced has reached into the hundreds. Most recently, some tiles were removed from the forward flaps and now we see numerous markings, likely indicating where adjustments are needed. Additionally, there are at least two massive strips of tiles missing right along the weld lines between sections of the prototype. And after our last discussion about the tiles, some of you suggested that the difference between the red and blue adhesive could be related to temperature tolerance. This is a good theory. Perhaps the red adhesive can withstand higher temperatures, but it is more challenging to remove, which might explain why it's only being used for the tiles with the most unusual shapes. Hopefully all this work means that the upcoming Flight 4 could not only progress further into re-entry, but might even fully survive it. Fingers crossed. As for the launch date, currently we're still looking at the second half of May, which definitely looks possible. Recently we've even got the FCC license that allows SpaceX to communicate with Starship during that mission. Though remember that the FCC license is something we see quite frequently, so don't take it as a sign of whether the launch is getting closer or not. Since we're already at the production site, let's also take a moment to check out the nearly completed Star Factory. The missing piece for mass production. This building is getting close to being operational. Aerial views show that the new section should soon connect to the original Star Factory. It's crazy to think that just a few months ago the production tents occupied this area. This process wouldn't normally be visible, but this is precisely why we're conducting these flyovers. Did you know you can take a helicopter ride over Starbase and get the same views as in our videos? Visit redlineheli.com slash felix to book your very own helicopter ride over Starbase with $25 off. You'll never forget this. On the ground, it is evident that the Star Factory's exterior is also nearing completion. The structural framework is complete and now workers are busy attaching the remaining front panels and painting the entire structure white. The area designated for the glass section is visible as well, but for those who find it hard to picture it, here is a render from our 3D artist Wooper to help visualize it. It is gonna look awesome. The pace of progress isn't just rapid at the front. At the back of the Star Factory, construction of the office mezzanine is underway. According to the official filings, the entire construction is scheduled for completion by January 1st, 2025. However, judging by the speed of current progress, it seems likely they'll finish well before the deadline. The new office space will be five levels tall, making it one of the largest structures at Starbase. And I can't wait to see the finished thing. Lastly, the scrapping of Legendary Booster 4 continues. Initially intended to be the first not quite orbital super heavy, it became obsolete by the time the launch site was ready for liftoff, leading SpaceX to switch to Booster 7. After spending much of its existence in the Rocket Garden, Booster 4 was cut in half at the end of March. Most of its segments have already been scrapped, however the aft section is receiving some extra focus. Currently, it is located at the Sanchez site, where engineers are removing its Raptor engines. Zooming in on this image, you can catch a glimpse of a rather uncommon site. 
the middle ring of nine Raptors. As some of you might recall, the older prototypes were equipped with 29 engines, not 33. Who knows, maybe in the future Super Heavy will get even more Raptors. What do you think will happen to these engines now? Will SpaceX scrap them? Or maybe we'll finally get some kind of exhibition at a place other than Starbase? Leave your opinions in the comments, I love reading them. Oh, and just a heads up, we've looked into our channel metrics and over 2 million returning monthly viewers have not subscribed yet. Help us grow the channel even further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our updates. And while you're at it, give us a like and become a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, including satellite, aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. We also have positions to fill on our team and the best place to look for the next talented team member is directly in our community. Right now, we're looking for another scriptwriter and researcher. If you're looking for new challenges and have comprehensive knowledge about spaceflight and Starbase, we'd love to hear from you. You might find yourself working with the Y team on a daily basis. The link to our Patreon page, the application form and our new website are in the description. Thank you to all our supporters who help us fund more crazy projects. We cannot thank you enough, you rock! Now before we continue with the news, here is a quick word about internet privacy from our sponsor. Thanks Felix. I've lost count how often I've been online and seen repeated ads for the same product across multiple websites. Protect your browsing behavior from prying eyes from today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. I use Surfshark VPN to create an alternate persona and email linked to my real one safeguarding my personal details if a website I've been used gets breached. This ensures that my identity is better secured when I'm online, and my hidden IP address prevents advertisers from tracking me across platforms. With Surfshark's customizable antivirus, I'm able to lock my webcam and surf the web carefree. Unlike other antivirus options, this one doesn't consume any CPU or RAM. I appreciate being able to use the internet without interruptions from antivirus malware scans protecting my device. Safeguard your personal data by securing your privacy with Surfshark. Enter coupon code FELIX for an extra three months free at surfshark.deals felix or scan the QR code on screen. Surfshark, surf with your own set of rules. Okay, back to the news. In the latest episode, we talked about the 20th reflight of a Falcon 9 booster. And while SpaceX is a pioneer in this topic, they aren't the only believers in rocket reusability. It is time to talk about Rocket Lab again. The journey toward reusability for the Electron rocket is certainly a fascinating one. Initially, the company's CEO, Peter Beck, was quite skeptical about the idea. In fact, he once declared he would eat his hat if Rocket Lab ever attempted to reuse Electron, and true to his word, he did just that. He actually ate his hat. Can you believe it? Though, to be fair, their skepticism regarding reuse wasn't completely baseless. Given Electron's small size, propulsive landing simply isn't feasible without significantly increasing the rocket's mass, which would essentially require just making a larger rocket. This feature will be reserved for Neutron, however there is one viable recovery method, parachutes. Assuming you can effectively shield the booster from the intense heat of re-entry and the corrosive seawater, parachutes are a lightweight, cost-effective and simple alternative to propulsive landing. Originally, Rocket Lab planned to snag the returning booster mid-air with a helicopter. Peter Beck once even said that the catch was the easy part and the real challenge was protecting the booster during re-entry. As it turned out, reality was quite the opposite. After a few attempts, the idea was abandoned as they realized that the boosters don't really suffer that much damage when splashing down in the ocean. Following several water recoveries, they managed to successfully conduct a static fire test of a previously flown Rutherford engine. This engine was then integrated and flown on the We Love the Nightlife mission in 2023, marking a significant milestone in Electron's reusability. But that was only the beginning. At the end of January, the company launched a mission called Four of a Kind. During this mission, the Electron splashed down into the ocean shortly after liftoff and was swiftly recovered by Rocket Lab's team. We've seen this process a few times before, so that part isn't necessarily groundbreaking. However, what is truly exciting is that this booster recently made its way back to the production line for final acceptance and qualification testing. You know what this means, right? They want to refly the entire first stage or at least reuse the propellant tanks. The language used in the press release leaves some room for speculation. 
At times it refers to the entire first stage and at others just the first stage tank. This could be due to the author not being that into the technical stuff or it might suggest that the first reflight of Electron could involve new engines while reusing only the tank. That would still be an incredible achievement. Another suspicious thing here is the quote from Peter Beck himself. He stated that if the stage passes its final tests, they'll consider reflying it in the new year, so 2025. This seems a bit weird, especially since the booster is already undergoing those final checks. This comment might have been made before 2024, or perhaps there is more happening behind the scenes, which is why we won't see a reused booster this year. Whatever the case, I can't wait to see another reusable rocket enter the market. So this is what's happening here on Earth, but what about Mars? Let's go there for a second. Despite high hopes and bold claims from Elon, starships aren't what we're seeing on the Martian surface, at least for now. Instead, what catches the eye are the soil samples collected by the Perseverance rover. How do we get them back? Meet the Mars Sample Return Program run by NASA and ESA. The plan is quite ambitious. To successfully bring back samples from Mars, the current mission requires a few things. And a few other things, and then some more things. A small rover to collect the samples, a lander equipped with a mini rocket silo, aka the Mars Ascent Vehicle, and an orbiter carrying a return capsule. The plan is for the rover to gather the samples and place them into the Mars Ascent Vehicle, which will then launch into orbit to transfer the samples to the orbiter that will bring them back to Earth. Definitely not a walk in the park. While much of the technology required for this mission, apart from launching a rocket from Mars, is already proven, the real challenge, as always, lies in funding it. Even in its most basic form, without additional technologies like the two small helicopters, the sample return mission is projected to cost NASA, hold on to your seatbelts, between 8 and 11 billion dollars. Cool. That's roughly four times the budget of the Perseverance mission, which itself is the most expensive Mars mission to date. As you might expect, this high cost has not been met with enthusiasm by Congress, which this year allocated only a third of the requested funding for the mission. Without an easy and effective cost reduction strategy, the program risks being cancelled or, at best, delayed into the early 2040s. In response, NASA has announced a redesign of the mission. Finally, they're seeking help not only from traditional research centers like the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but also from the private sector. This opens up a unique opportunity. If you run a space company and have innovative ideas on how to lower the cost of retrieving Martian samples, NASA is asking for your input. Many of you might be thinking, what about Starship? Just send one and get tons of samples. Well, you see, the primary issue is developing the technology required to collect the samples and send them back. The launch itself is actually the cheapest part of the mission. For perspective, the launch of the Perseverance lander made up less than 10% of the total mission cost. However, it is not out of the question that SpaceX might propose a solution. After all, they are the people who turn impossible into late. While NASA is hunting for solutions, the European Space Agency, on the other hand, has finally found one for their own Mars program. ExoMars was a joint program by ESA and Roscosmos. Was. Together, back in 2016, they launched not one, but two vehicles to study the red planet's exobiology. These are the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is operational to this day, and the Schiparelli Landing Demonstrator, which unfortunately crashed upon landing. Despite this partial setback, the collaboration continued with plans to deploy the Rosalind Franklin rover to Mars. This vehicle, approximately a third the size of NASA's Perseverance, was supposed to explore the rusty planet to search for signs of life. The deal for this mission was simple, ESA builds the rover and Russia provides their lander. Unfortunately, due to parachute issues that have plagued the program since its inception, the 2020 launch was delayed to 2022 and then to 2023. However, due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ESA severed all ties with them, leading to a suspension of the mission. Finally, on April 9th, they brought the program back to life by awarding a contract worth over $550 million to Thales Alien Space. This company will now perform the construction of the lander and the mission will be launched aboard an American rocket, likely Falcon Heavy. It is great that ExoMars survived, however we won't be seeing its launch anytime soon. The current NET or not earlier than launch date for this mission is the year 2028. 
That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button. Subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Want to learn more? Get with me, buddy. <laughs> Terminating. Another thing that located at the to much of the technology. The grind never stops. <laughs>